I decided that there were so many amazing bikes inside of the National Cycle Museum that we needed another video, and this time to show you some absolutely incredible bits of engineering. So here I am, waiting for them to open. I'm chomping at the bit to check out more and more great stuff in there. Here we go. A couple of bikes that I dreamt of owning as a kid, and I still do dream of owning as an adult. These two Colnagos. First up, this one here, just like the Mexico that Giuseppe Cerrone used back in 1982 to win the Goodwood World Championships. Decked out, of course, in full Campagnolo. I'm not sure the exact model of it. I do apologize. Uh, we've got some drilled out brake levers here too, just to minimize the weight a little bit. Fitted on the bike, of course, we've got a pair of toe clip style pedals, and even with the original Campagnolo toe strap, on there with a little emblem and a little screw that you would put it into place once you trim them down to the ideal length for you. Uh, we've got a pair of Mavic GP4 rims on here, tubular, they're like a tubular training rim and the tyres fitted onto them are the quite strangely named Walt, Walber, sorry, Invulnerable, so they're not vulnerable, it's pretty cool naming uh, strategy of them. I'm going to move though onto this. Colnago behind it because this is when things get super interesting for me. As a 10 year old, this was the bike I dreamt of having. Shimano Jura A7400 STI levers, the first combined brake and gear levers there were commercially available. I never got to have them, enough of that. I've done a video all about that actually. Uh, but we've got a Colnago frame and it had that really cool fluted style tubing uh, on it, which apparently was done so to try and increase the rigidity over a standard round steel tube. This one appears to have actually been repainted or painted specially for a customer. Uh, done so by a company uh, in Berlard in Belgium. Uh, but they have left some of the real telltale signs of Colnago. So they've not painted over the club logo on the bottom bracket shell. And also the club logo here you can see on the fork crown and just the Colnago engraved. Colnago was the real sort of uh, sort of cutting edge or the real traditional Italian frame that we all seeked when we were younger riders. Like I said, Shimano Jura Ace throughout, got a pair of Look Arc pedals on there. So they used the old Delta style cleats. Uh, and that's when really the floating pedals were talked about a lot because previous to that, pedals had you in a fixed position, even the clipless ones. We've got something on this bike which I did have the pleasure of owning. And that was the Cinelli splash handlebar tape. So genuine cork. I always remember that on the advertising. I even had it in this very same colorway on a bike that I owned that was pink or fuchsia with a little bit of yellow on there. Turbo saddle, got one of those luckily. And the Walber rims, Walber Profile 20s, super narrow, super lightweight. Yeah, this bike, I dreamt of it and I'd still have it now, definitely. This is the ultimate, and it belonged to the late Bruce Bursford, who was a rider who loved to go for speed records. And on board this bike, he got the world speed record on a rolling road that was done at the Brooklands Motor Museum in England. And it was helped along the way by the fact that he had fitted onto it 104 teeth on that chain ring at the front and then just 14 on the fixed sprocket at the rear. This bike is totally custom, just one of a kind. Just check out the saddle, for instance. It's built into the seat mast, that's built into the frame. There is just nothing left to the imagination of it. The cranks too, totally custom. Royce titanium bottom bracket inside. Square taper though, which is pretty cool, must say. Uh, the wheel. It's not as thin as what you might imagine there. It's quite bulbous really towards the hub and the forks, they take a really deep profile. That must be sort of maybe 10 to one ratio, something like that. Handlebars remind me like the bat wing or something like that, sort of a, an exotic spoiler maybe of a Japanese sports car and the actual handlebar extensions. You can see just there where they're molded onto the bars. They go really far forward, nearly to the end of that front wheel too. The rear wheel is actually underneath this, listen to that, it sounds like a snare drum. It's not a snare drum though, but inside of there is actually a standard spoked rear wheel. So not a disc wheel in sight. I'd love to, I'd love to be able to peel it back and see what was in there, but it ruined the surprise, I guess. Got a pair of Continental Olympic tires fitted on there. I'm not sure if they're still made. Um, 
And I've got a very good feeling too that when Bruce went for the record to try and get the wheels up to speed as quickly as possible, they're actually filled with helium just to uh, save on a little bit of weight. A really nice cutout here of the rear wheel so it could get in super, super close to the, I'd like to say seat tube, but it's just into the frame. Uh, the dropouts down there too, they're closed off so the wheel has to be fitted specially. I'm gonna try and reach forward and show you there appears to be like a little hole that's been filled in. So I wonder if at some point this was also destined to be fitted with a rear derailleur of some kind. Either way, it's one of those bikes that I've always wanted to see, just like the Lotus bike, and I've finally been able to see it. And in case you're wondering the cost, they reckon about 25,000 pounds, but I think it must have cost more. It must have done because everything on it is so tricked out and custom. The seat alone, this. This is my favourite bit, it has to be, because I've been saying for years, someone should do something more aerodynamic with the saddles. Years ago, I saw the Australian track team, they were doing something with cling film underneath their saddles. This is slightly more advanced than cling film, and it's beautiful. Bruce, nice one. When I think helmets, I think protection. But way back before they were actually obligatory, riders were using helmets to sometimes try and get a little bit faster too. Yeah. So Bruce Bursford, he even made his own helmet of ultra thin carbon fiber. You can see there, there's absolutely no padding inside of it. Just simply a couple of Velcro straps. That's all that was holding it in place. And it was designed purely to try and cheat the wind a little bit better. Look how close fitting that is. Aero, even with a hood on. And if the Bruce Bursford Ultimate isn't enough for you, what about this then, the Ultimate Tandem? Literally, the Ultimate Tandem. Mind-blowingly beautiful. I can't begin to explain to you exactly what I think about it, because it's just, oh, it's the lines and everything. It's just the type of carbon, the weave. It's so cool. Oh, and that behind, that's a Sinclair X1 uh, prototype, kind of recumbent-like fared bicycle. But this one, that wins all day, every day. Many years ago, when riders used to ride out to events, they would take spare wheels with them, or rather their race wheels, like this. So they'd fit them onto something called a sprint carrier that would fit in between the quick release or the nut of the axle, then they simply would go out and hold a wheel in place and then strap to the handlebar at the top there to prevent them from spinning around whilst riding. This was done because quite often the race wheels would use lightweight silk tubular tyres, and of course they're quite fragile, you don't see this anymore because cars are way more popular for getting to events with. The Rally Centenary, to celebrate 100 years of rally back in 1987. So what did they do? They decided to gold plate a Reynolds 531 competition tube set, which has to be one of my favorite steel tube sets of all times. There's something so cool about the feel of riding one of those bikes. We've got a suede style, I think it's a turbo saddle. It could well be an Isca cell actually, to match up with a brown handlebar tape. Normally, I wouldn't necessarily like brown bar tape that much, or a brown saddle, but I think on this bike it looks pretty good. Interestingly too, they've done the handlebar tape from top to bottom, something which is going to be split decision out there with the viewers. It's got a Shimano 105 group set on here too, six speed, and it is in absolutely showroom-like condition. The brakes on here too, the single pivot, they feel so smooth like the day they rolled out of the showroom. I like this bike a lot. Cutting edge TT tech back in the 80s now. A Sabre built bike here by Bartram, who were from the Kidderminster region of the UK. 753 tube set, super light that was. In fact, you had to undertake an exam and build a miniature frame, and they were always really nice to have a little look at there. We've got a pair of 531 chrome forks at the front, and on the rear, I've also got some chrome seat stays and chain stays there. Always nice if you were to drop your chain. You don't scratch the fancy paintwork. And this bike does have some rather understated, but I think quite fancy metallic, sort of magenta style paintwork on it. Campagnolo group set, aside from the Wyman brakes. The Wyman brakes are really slimmed down, minimalistic, ideal for a TT. But what about Drillium then? Often spoke about, not that often seen anymore. The art of drilling out components to try and save a little bit of weight because in a TT, you're not really out of the saddle that much, so you're not putting the bike under too much stress where anything could fail, the famous last words, because it 
happened eventually. So on the rear derailleur cage here, on the Hure rear mech, we do also have some drilled out holes there. And whilst I look at the rear end, I'm just gonna point out the little adjusters here for the rear dropouts. Normally, they come with a little knurled knob on them and they're really, really small, whereas these have more of a, a wing style platform to them and I prefer them a lot more. 24 inch wheel front wheel, oh, crazy. Speedwell, that was a company that was founded way back in the 1890s and fabricated things out of sheet metal. And well, in 1973, Louis O'Connor actually rode one of their titanium frames during the Tour de France. And there is one right over my shoulder. These grubby little hands wanna get all over it because I've heard it was super light for a bike back in the day. Just over four pounds, which was pretty light. It's just a shame I can't get in to get really close to it. The Baines Flying Gate, designed in such a way that the rider could have a nice short wheelbase, which was ideal for a racing cyclist because back when these bikes were originally built, you know, in the 1930s, bikes were quite relaxed in their geometry and everything. One thing you would have to be quite careful about is making sure that your seat post, of course, wouldn't go all the way down and interfere with the wheel in there if it was nicely tucked into the dropouts. But I have a memory of a, a guy riding a time trial on one of these when I was growing up and I was absolutely gobsmacked thinking, what is that? I have seen a few here and there, but you don't tend to see them that often. So I'm really privileged actually to see such a fine bit of engineering. It must have been very stiff too, because we've got one, two, three, four triangles in there. Four, yeah. Here we go, a triplet bike. Don't often see very many of these being used. And I could imagine possibly you could use them in a time trial event, although you'd most definitely win your category, as I don't think there'd be another one in an event anyway. Probably use them more for recreational purposes, let's say. I love looking at them because it's now when you realize just how special they are. Take for instance, the rear brake cable. Here we are, the length of that. You can't pop into your local bike shop and say, could I have a really, 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 really long brake cable, please? Because this is probably an extra half as long as a standard rear brake cable. Sticking with that rear brake cable, let's have a look at the rear brake because there's not one, but there's two. So of course this is before the time of disc brakes or anything like that. But we've got these two brakes on here. Uh, now this one at the rearmost part of the bicycle is actually controlled by the actual pilot of the bike there. And then the rear stoker instead of the middle one, if you like, is also controlling this brake here. So what is really throwing me a little bit is that I had to check which way around the cables are actually rooted. So we've got a right hand rear on the rear and a right hand front on the front, so to say. So there's obviously probably some thinking behind it, but I'm not exactly sure what, but just looking at them, it makes me wonder how on earth these were ever ridden around corners, especially sharp ones. It'd be Truly terrifying. Final nugget then of info on this bike is that these pedals, the Look PP66, pretty sure that's what they're called. Someone out there will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, were my first ever pair of clipless pedals. I loved those. Back in 1994, I did really well in a race and my dad said, well done son, you've deserved those. So he went out and bought me a pair. But the weirdest thing about all of this is that the pedals on the front of this triplet are actually the ones which I had prior to those. Although I had some sort of plasticky toe clips rather than these metal ones, but the base pedal definitely exactly the same. How cool is that? Could be mine. Maybe not. No bicycle museum tour could be complete without one of these, the Rally Chopper. In 1971, apparently rally sales increased by 55% and they sold 1.5 million units of this bike alone. The mismatched wheels, if you like, a bigger one on the back than on the front. The big saddle too, which you weren't meant to carry your mates on, but everyone did. And of course, the gear lever too. So if you slid off that saddle, you knew about that gear lever sooner or later. Very cool, very, very desirable. And if you weren't big enough to ride that, then you were given his little brother or his little sister, the Tomahawk. I never had either. I was too old. Well, I was too young. I wasn't even born. Maybe you're like me then, and you weren't born or old enough to get your backside on top of that chopper. Well, this is the Grifter from Rally. This had motocross inspirational theme bits on it, such as the fenders, or the mudguards as we call them, front and rear. Not to mention too, this little pad here on the handlebar, so if you were to hit your chest on it, it's not gonna hurt too much, or at least it's gonna dull the pain for a second until you 
parents come along and pick you up off the floor. Then we've got a two-speed Sturmi Archer twist style shifter on the right hand side, just like on a motorbike. Pull that throttle and you're gonna go. In this case, pull that throttle by mistake and you're probably gonna slow down a little bit. Either way, kids wanted one of these split down tube. Nice. Now I've gotta say, and I'm the first to admit, I don't know very much about rickshaws, but what I do like about them is the fact that there's always loads of really intricate details on them. So take this one, you've got a nice little canopy here with some quite fancy fabric patterns, and then all of these rivets on there too, this brass styling always stands out. And I reckon the pilots or the owners of them take great care in them. Now, they are very, very popular. Certain parts of the world where they're very crowded and it's not necessarily that easy to maneuver a car, these are ideal for getting someone around in. So they've obviously got a very low gear on them because if you've got two adult passengers and maybe a small child in the back, you need to get up to speed. Probably only go out 10 miles an hour, say, but that's more than adequate. That is probably as much detail as I can give, other than obviously it's got reinforced uh, bars and tubes on them to actually help with the safety of them being up to the job, I guess you could say. Speaking of that, the wheels on these, the rear wheels have got 64 spokes. I've never seen a wheel with 64 spokes on anything. Oh, and the tires on the wheels, Dunlop rickshaws. Never knew that was a thing. There we are, part two of the National Cycle Museum Explored. And I've got to say, again, a huge thanks to the staff there because, well, they had to put up with me rooting through everything, trying to find stuff to show off. Let me know what your favorite bit was down there in the comment section below. And remember as well to like and share this video with your friends too. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the little notification icon so you get alerted each and every time we put a video live. Don't forget to check out the GCN shop at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And me, I'm gonna leave before I actually stay my welcome because when I visit these places I have a tendency to do that because I love bike tech. See you later. Can we go back?